So hi everyone, um, we're just letting people in. We are very sorry for the delay, uh, but as you know, uh, things happened uh, in technical aspect. Um, so welcome everyone. I just uh, need someone to tell me if the um, uh, YouTube is working and I will just ask everyone to just um, 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 uh, mute themselves if it's not the case already. Um, and I will um, start slowly the seminar. Um, so first of all, so thanks uh, everyone to be here. So the, the politics of economics is uh, resuming this activity and we are, we are very happy to have uh, Emmanuel uh, Didier as a first speaker this term. Um, so I will um, uh, just say a few things before presenting uh, our speaker today. Um, First, we have a second seminar uh, with Andrea Meniken, who is also in the room. Uh, it will be on 8th of December. Uh, what we're going to have, um, the, the organization of the seminar is as follows. We will have a, a short talk by Emmanuel. Then I will have uh, ask two or three questions. And then we will open the, fl the, the, the floor to uh, the question. Please use the chat box to, to um, ask a question. Or you could also um, uh, use uh, YouTube or uh, 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 Twitter. Uh, and so, yeah. So I just, again, thank you for being here. Uh, so Emmanuel uh, Didier uh, is a full professor at the Centre uh, Maurice Albax uh, at the École Normale Supérieure de Paris. Uh, and is a member of the Center for the Study of Invention and Social Process at Goldsmiths in London. Uh, he also teaches at the Ecole, Normal, uh, Ecole Nationale sorry, de la Statistique et de l'Administration Économique, also in Paris. Uh, he's just published a, 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 sorry, a translation, but it's an updated edition of his book, which I will just send um, uh, the link in the chat. Uh, uh, and it's, okay, I'll probably send the link right after. It's, uh, the title is American, American Numbers. Uh, and it's, um, I think Emmanuel will talk a little bit about uh, this book too in the presentation. Um, and so today uh, we uh, will hear him on um, uh, how uh, the social uh, studies of statistics in general can be used, useful to understand the current crisis. So thanks a lot for joining us. Um, I. Um, you could unmute yourself, uh, uh, Emmanuel, and so we listen to you for your presentation uh, right now. Hello, folks. Thanks, thanks a lot for inviting me to, for this talk, and I'm very proud, that, uh, very honored to be the first speaker. And I'm sorry because I'm really, I'm really not. Uh, um, so I just missed, I, uh, lost my, my PowerPoint. So you won't have a PowerPoint. Maybe it's going to come up right during the talk, but uh, I'm not sure about it. So, and, and the effect of this is that maybe, uh, and I already apologize for this, my, my talk will be maybe less structured than it, it, I would like it to be. Uh, so first of all, <clears throat> I would like to insist on the fact that we are living in the in the in the in the, in the COVID crisis, uh, and this COVID crisis is not only an epidemic; it's also a quantodemic, uh, an epidemic of quantification and numbers. I don't know if you noticed, but there are always and everywhere numbers about the number of deaf people, the number of uh, hospitalized people. There are lots of models circulating everywhere lots of maps, lots of uh, data, lots of, so, and data is really up on, in the news very often. So to understand the crisis is probably to understand also all these numbers that, uh, that's, that go with it. And uh, uh, that uh, uh, to understand, first of all, where they come from and what are, are their social effects. To do this, we have a, a, a tool, well, a discipline, sub-discipline, uh, an amount of uh, research that we, we can call the social studies of quantification. This is uh, something that has quite a, few, uh, a long history. It, it, uh, lots of people have already worked on, on uh, studying uh, quantification as a sub social object, as something that lives with us as a social actor. 
and uh, we study quantification like that. So some, some sociologists study uh, soccer, some social, social, sociologists study family, etc. We study quantification per se and as social actor. And the question that we may ask is how the study of quantification as a social actor may help us understand better and participate to the, the, to the, to the fight against the, 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 the crisis. So first of all, <clears throat> Uh, I will answer this question in three parts. First, I will try to understand what, what is exactly a crisis. Second, uh, how it can help uh, understand better and frame the social construction of, the, of those numbers and the political effects of these numbers. And, and third, I would like to insist on the, on the, on the, uh, the role, the very important role played by ethics of quantifications nowadays. Okay, so this is, this is, these are my, my three points. The first point is about what is a crisis. It's interesting to, to uh, think about the, the concept of crisis because very often we think that a crisis is when the, the series of numbers go down. So for example, or up, for example, the, the amount of unemployed people goes very up, the, the GDP goes down, and this might be a crisis. In fact, I studied uh, the, the Great Depression in the 1930s, precisely in the book that uh, Chloe was kind enough to, to present to you. So the, the title of the book is uh, America by the Numbers. And it's, it's a study of, of uh, the relationship between politics, so society, and numbers during the Great Depression. And what is very clear cut when you go back to, the, to these uh, 1930s is that a, a crisis is not a moment when the numbers go down. It's a moment when the numbers really go, simply go astray. I mean, they don't work. The, the, the series that they had uh, before, they are not useful anymore to, 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 to fight against the crisis, okay? So for example, the, the, the very striking example is that uh, in the 1930s, the amount of, of unemployed grew up in a very strikingly, very uh, importantly, no, sorry, I, I want to go back. It was possible to see in the street lots of unemployed people, many, many unemployed people, but precisely the point is that they didn't have an unemployment series. At that time, nobody knew exactly how many unemployed they had and why? Because it was the first time massive unemployment uh, appeared. So nobody had uh, the idea of creating the, the numbers before. They had to build the number and to build the methods through which you can count the unemployed at that time. So the point is that when you're in a real deep crisis, the problem that you have is that the, the, the state of, the, of society, the, the tools, the reflexivity tools, so the, the statistics that you use to take a grasp res, reflexively on society, and the political, uh, the policies that, uh, uh, act, um, th that are implemented are not articulated anymore. I hope I'm clear. So, the, 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 the statistical techniques that you, that you use, they are not adequate for the new state of society that you want to describe, okay? This is the, this is the, the main point. So it's very interesting to study uh, uh, crisis, big crisis like, like the one we are in, because the problem is that former and old statistics doesn't fit anymore, they don't work. We have to, we have to invent new kind of statistics, okay? So, so this is my, my first point. Second point, so what are those new kinds of statistics that are, are appearing right now during the crisis? So I studied in a very short paper, which was actually not a paper, it was a, it was a, a sort of an op-ed that I sent to a, to a, a newspaper called AOC, Analyse Opinion Critique, AOC. And the idea in this is to simply take uh, for granted that when you publish numbers, this has political effects. First of all, those numbers are constructed by someone. They don't appear all by themselves. They are constructed by humans. So they are the object of, they are the effect of human activity. And second, then they have political effects. And one of the qu questions that we, we may raise was, what is the political effect of having these numbers of dead people published every evening in the press? I don't know 
it, it, it's less the case nowadays, but for, during the first lockdown, the first wave, as, as they say, it was very striking that every night in the press, in the, in the, every morning in the press and every night in the news, you had the number of people dead, okay? And so we could, we could ask what was the effect of this? And well, I failed, maybe probably, I was alone in my home because I was locked down. <laughs> the effect on me was an effect of frightening me, I, I have to say. I thought that uh, uh, it was frightening to see all these people dying. So I thought maybe if it's the effect on me, maybe it's, I'm not the only one. Maybe this effect is, is uh, shared by other people. We can discuss it, but uh, this, what, I, what, I, I, what is true, and I, sh I am sure, is that when you publish these, uh, these numbers all every day, this has political effects. One of the effects, I may say, would be to have to frighten people. The other effect was that was very interesting, that is that it was used, and this was clear also, by every government to benchmark each other. So the idea was, <clears throat> if, you, if you are Emmanuel Macron or Boris Johnson, then you want to have less death than the, the country, uh, the other countries, okay? It's important to show that your policy, the policies and the decision that you took saved life, okay? So it was a way to benchmark every government one against the other, okay? So one of the, one of the uses that <clears throat> we might uh, identify uh, of these numbers is precisely to benchmark the, the other, okay? And the a third point that I want to insist on is that social study of quantification helps also imagine and be creative and be imaginative to uh, think about data that are not there, that we might be interested in and are not there. And for example, in France, and I, it's not only in France, it's everywhere, one of the big problems nowadays is to articulate uh, public health measures with uh, with economical uh, measures, so you you want to, the, the governments are looking for ways to uh, raise the amount of infected people down, so to lock down the economy, but at the same time to let the economy lay, live. Okay, and one point that we one data that we don't have at all is precisely the relationship between the two. You see, so there is something very striking in France. I, I guess it's the same in, in Great Britain. We we don't have, for example, the the social status, and the, we call that in French, uh, les catégories socio-professionnelles, the, the, social, the social status, the, the professions of the people who are infected or who died from the, from the, uh, from the virus. So we don't know what's, what's the kind of people, that, what's the economical kind of people that, are, that is hit by the, by the, the pandemics. Um, and, the, and the other point is that we don't have also the price of the measures that we are taking, okay? So I read in Le, in Le Monde this morning, there is a, a French guy called Camille Landais. I don't know if you, you know this guy. He works at LSE, very bright person. He proposed a very, I think, very striking idea. He, he proposed um, to establish a number of points for each measure so if you take this measure, for example, a lockdown, you win lots of points concerning health, uh, health uh, prevention. So for example, lockdown uh, take, gives you lots of points, you save lots of lives, but then you have to, to buy it for a certain price, okay? And so his point, his idea is that you could, we could have a list of all the measures, the possible measures, how many points every single measure uh, gives you and how much they cost. And the point was, would, would be that the governments could, could, in a sense, go to the market and buy the points that they want according to the money that they want to spend, you see? So I, I don't know if it's realist or not. I, I, it's not the, the problem, but the, 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 what I want to insist on is that he's proposing ways to articulate money, economic uh, data with health, public health data, you see, to make an articulation between, between these two kinds of variables. Okay, so I'm finishing my second point. I think uh, social studies of quantification may, might, be help, might be useful to help understanding how data are constructed, how they have a political effect and what data are missing. It gives you imaginative, it gives you imaginative uh, ideas. Okay, then third, there is something which is very interesting is that the, the demo, 
the, the, the demand from society, what I receive as a demand very often as a, as a requirement, as a question is give us some ethical points about data. We want to have ethical, ethical thinkings, ethical tensions about uh, data. And I think it's very interesting to understand what is this, this uh, uh, question, what, what does it mean to have this question about ethics? Uh, it's very present. So usually I come from SS, uh, social studies of science, uh, like most of you, I guess. And in social studies of science, we have the, the, we have the tradition to, to despise a lot uh, ethics. <laughs> I don't know if, it's, if, if you feel like that, but when I was, when I was a student, we, we used to think that people, ethicists, for example, were really our enemies. Uh, or not any enemies, but our, uh, how to say that, we, we used to look, look, look down upon them, really. Now I'm, I'm older, <laughs> and I think that uh, we, th we should think about what, what, what is their, their demand. And the, the, the point is that I think we have tools to be able to, so for example, so we wrote, I wrote uh, uh, a nature comment with lots of statisticians, uh, I think uh, uh, Cleo sent it around the, the, this, this, this comment where we devised five uh, ethical points about uh, uh, models, okay? So unfortunately, those points were on my PowerPoint. I, I won't be able to, to go back on them uh, simply uh, like that, but uh, uh, we can go back to the, to, the, to the comment if we need. The, 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 the point <coughs> is that most of the of these ethical requirements is to be clear on the uh, presuppositions of the data, and I think the comment uh, is written as if it were it was obvious to identify those presuppositions and these effects of the data. But I think the 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 the, 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 the ones who are the most able to identify those presuppositions and political effects are pre pre precisely people coming from SSSQ, from social studies of quantifications. It's not that easy to know, even when you're a statistician, to know what are your presuppositions and what will be the effects of your data, even if you, uh, if you twist them a little bit or if you, this is not easy to know that. And I think this is something that we know how to do that. So the idea was, would, would be to, to that uh, social studies of quantification is a tool that uh, provides, provides reflexivity to statisticians so that they have ways to be clearer in their interactions with politicians and the public at large. So my conclusion is the following. I don't know how, how long I, I talk. Maybe I, I'm, I'm going to stop right now. Uh, my conclusion is the following. Social study of quantification is useful in the case of, of our pandemics. First of all, it helps us define and understand exactly what are the problems associated with a crisis. So framing the crisis, this is what we can help uh, participate. Second, we help analyze the presuppositions, the social effects, and give imagine the imaginative in the creation of new information. And third, we can help answer a, a, a demand that comes from society, which is a demand of ethics in, in data. Thanks a lot. I think, I hope it, I, I have been clear enough. <laughs> and sorry for my rusted, rusted English. <laughs> Thanks a lot um, for this very interesting talk. Um, I, I will just, um, because we're like, we have um, probably question. Um, I have three short questions I want to ask. Um, and um, I'll start by the, the end, um, uh, like your conclusion. So I'm, I'm completely in, in agreement with you about the social um, study of uh, statistics uh, 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 as very useful, uh, but is it used? So my, my question is about like, do you think um, um, your expertise is used right now? in the sense of... Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Oh no. So this is, a, this, is a, <laughs> this is interesting because it's also a biography, okay, biographical question. Do you, do you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Yes.
difficult question. Okay, am I the only one to... I didn't hear that. Yeah, I'm afraid we missed your answer, Emmanuel. Do you mind repeating that? Well, again, I'll try again. Your question is interesting because it is also a biographical question. Okay, you got it? It's always the same thing. Is your knowledge used? This is always this is also a way to benchmark each other. <laughs> can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So the fact is that now I sit in a board. They wanted me to sit in this ethics board precisely. So this is a way that uh, uh, for which I got I got used. The other point was uh, indeed to analyze. Maybe I'll go, to, I'll go to this second point later, but I want to insist on the, on the ethics board. So there is something in French called Le Conseil Consultatif National d'Ethique. Conseil Consultatif National d'Ethique. So in there, you have lots of uh, uh, medical doctors, lots of uh, biologists, life scientists, uh, public health people, etc., and they are interested because, precisely because of this, because I am able to show tensions inherent to quantification. You see, so this is a way that, uh, and we 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 write uh, how do you call that? Uh, in French, we call that this avis. Not we don't write papers in this case. In this case, we we write this this avis. Opinions, in a sense, opinions or, or, or guidelines. It might be guidelines in English. So this is one of the ways it is used. Thanks. Um, so, the, and two other, maybe you could um, answer them together. Um, I think it's very interesting you say um, how this type of knowledge can be useful is to point to what is missing, what data is missing. Um, and so you give us a um, very interesting uh, example. Um, I just wanted to hear what you think about in terms of the unit of analysis, because in the long history of statistics, statistics where like you have states and you have households, so you have those very those units that take a lot of time to build. And so I was, yeah, what do you think is missing in terms of data scale because it's a global pandemic and so but we're still very much relying on like state but we yeah things doesn't really fit uh, those category and and the last question is very quick it's like because we the, we're interested in economics and i wanted to know what you think about what about economics in those things because economics is supposed to be the the, the queen of the quantification uh, uh in terms of um, uh, comparing to other social science um, and so there is a lot of um, uh, stakes, I think, in terms of division of labor between the social science. And so how do you think this is uh, working or not working? So uh, I, just, I just got my, my PowerPoint. If you want me to send it around, I don't know how to, to do that. Um, yeah, I'm, don't, I'm not sure we... We need it now. I don't know. Do you want to show a specific slide? So, uh, oh yes, uh, uh, globalized level. When so when I was studying the Great Depression, the nineteen thirties. The striking point was that at that time, they invented social surveys. They invented random sampling. My accent is awful. People usually don't understand what I mean. Rand random sampling. I, I hope it's clear. Random sampling. I mean, <clears throat> yes, exactly. <laughs> thanks, 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 Chloe. So they invented a new, a whole new technique that now is Very important for all 
statistics. The idea that you can withdraw a sample and have this sample more or less represent because you don't only produce new methods. And I think it to information that is, I mean, that are wider than only national data. So I think you're absolutely right. The, the very important point is that, uh, but, but the, the, the tools that we have on, at hand are very poor. The uh, World Health Organization is really, um, how to put it? They are not able to really produce surveys and data about the, about the world. They, they are only able to gather the data produced here and there. There are absolutely no unification of methods within Europe. This is very, very sad. For example, the, the, one of the points with the, you know, this app that would uh, tell you, how, if you if you met someone who is uh, positive, there are, no, there are no unification of the data in, within Europe. So uh, it's more or less not possible to use it crossing boundaries uh, within Europe, et cetera. So I think you're right. The, the point is that, uh, it's very important to create global networks of data. Uh, okay. So second, what is the role of economics? Economics, the, the interesting point with economics is that uh, very often they want to use the data. It's rare that they really, um, it's interesting because they do produce their own database but the, very often what they do is that they hide the whole process of producing the, uh, the, the database and all the, all the interventions that they have within the database and they, they transform it into methodology. So they, it, 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 it's hiding all the decisions, all the, all the, the cultural and political decisions within the category called methodology. And I think it's, uh, it's a, it's interesting to go within to deep this, within this methodology to understand better what are the decisions that have been taken taken while constructing the data. Once this is said, I think economists uh, play a very important role. Even though with this pandemics, they have been on the second, uh, they have been distant, if I may say so. The, the the first kind of knowledge that has that have been used, obviously, is um, public health. In France, we have this we have this uh, Comité scientifique, scientific committee. I don't know if you've, you've seen this. Macron, when the when the, the pandemics began, Macron organized a, a scientific committee, and within this co scientific committee, there is an anthropologist, there is a sociologist, but there there, are, there is no no economists at all, and they were very influential. Now he created a second co uh, committee, but still, this co the second committee uh, composed mainly of uh, economists, uh, part of which is. Camille Landais, the one I was mentioning right now, now to you, but this this second committee is much less influential than the than the than the the life science committee. Did I answer your question, Chloe? Chloe? Yes, yes. I think we could. I will give um, the floor to Jack, we will, which will, will have several questions for you from the chat. Hi, thank you. We have a number of. Four questions slash comments. I'm gonna. I've got them as they've come up. I'm gonna invite them. To, uh, invite the questioners to give their own question if they want, or I'll read them out. So the first is a, a question slash comment from Anne Galpin. Would uh, Would you like to read it yourself, or shall I read it out for everyone? Oh, you could it, uh... No, I mean, I, I, we can, we, it will be read either. Yeah, Anne, go ahead. You're muted. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm not. Um, did you, uh, Emmanuel? I think you, you've actually your last bit actually answered some of my queries. I'm not a social scientist. I'm a, um, a disability campaigner. Di disabled people's. I'm disabled and a disabled um, people's organisation campaigner. Um, in and the, there has been evident. Um, there has been some good new data, well, I now querying about the data, but there's been some, from a disabled activist point of view, there has been 
specific research on the unequal impact. But thank you. Listening as a lay person, I'm learning a lot that this data may not be what it all that it seems. So I may have you may have already answered my queries, but I'll, I'll carry on listening as a layperson. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I think I see your question precisely. All this data, for, especially in France, but well, uh, but we, we have very people when they go to the hospital, they have they have a, a, a medical file, so everybody knows everything about the medical files, so they know how about, uh, if they had the uh, disease last year, etc. But they don't know nothing about their work situation, for example. Uh, so it's and it's interesting to see who's the, the social strata, for example, who's hit by the by the uh, by, by by the pandemics. In the U.S., they have something. In France, I don't I don't know about the Great Britain, but in the U.S., so they have this uh, r r racial categorization. You know if people are black or not, okay? And uh, black is a very good uh, proxy for labor, labor uh, for um, worker. I mean. Uh, uh, poor worker, to, to put it uh, in a nutshell. I'm sorry to, to be uh, too simply stick like that, but uh, let's put it. In France, we don't have this kind of, uh, of uh, proxy, so we don't know who's the, 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 the kind of uh, population of workforce that is hit by the data. Um, we have two uh, comment slash questions. I'm not sure if you, do you, did you mean Jay Savary? I, I can't see your full name. It's in an email address and David Good both had comments on the framing. Um, uh, do you, do either of you want to ask them as questions or should I just leave them as comments and move on? If you do just turn your video off and I will turn you, I'll unmute you. David or Jay? No. Okay. Uh, in which case, just if you want to, if you want to t ask a specific question, I can, uh, read it out. Oh, um, your question, okay, thanks very much, Jay. Uh, it stays added to the quest, uh, to the chat that my question's already been answered. Um, the question, it was related to um, whether, yeah, sorry, it's, it's already been sort of answered. Sorry, I, I, I missed that. Um, okay, the next question is from Andreas. Andreas, would you like me to read out the question or would you like to uh, read it yourself? If you like. If you would like to read it yourself, then uh, feel, just unturn off your screen. I've unmuted you. Maybe you're not there. Okay, I'll read out Andreas's question. Andreas says, can you please reflect to what extent the pandemic has changed the way in which global data is constructed, represented and consumed? So he's thinking particularly about things like our world and data or the COVID government response tracker. So in what extent does this mean that the, the global data has uh, changed the way global data is constructed? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not clear because uh, I see Andrea's, Andrea Manikin has asked a question about the t temporality. Andreas, and uh, Andreas, uh, Mauricio, uh, that was that's further up. I'm asking them in the order they come. Hi, Andreas, how are you? <laughs> uh, global data is constructed, represented, consumed, and thinking about projects such as our world data. So, so yeah, I don't know if you can hear. I have, I've been, yes. I have been having problems with my uh, with my video. So, but I'm here. <laughs> we okay. can hear you. We can hear you. Please ask your question again. We can understand it better. Yes, great. Uh, thank you for your talk, Manuel. It was quite interesting. Uh, I'm I'm wondering if you can reflect upon uh, to what extent the pandemic has changed in meaningful ways the way in which global data or data that has the pretension to be global or represent a global phenomenon uh, has changed in the way in which it is construed, represented and consumed. And I'm thinking about particular projects as awarding data or multi-COVID uh, policy government response trackers, uh, which in a way have a pretension also to make data open and, and to be open in, in also in the way in which data is collected and uh, and what it is actually representing. So so I, I don't know if you have any thoughts about this that you would like to share with us. What, what struck me during the, the pandemic is that precisely the data is not global yet. Uh, if you, I, I remember, and it's not still the case, 
if you compare, it's not possible to nowadays the, the hardcore stuff. If you count, for example, because it's it's uh, it's complicated to identify the cause of a, uh, of a death. Okay, especially in the case of COVID, because lots of people who die from the COVID die also from uh, co morbidities, as we say. Okay, so for example, people who died, they died also because they were uh, obese, because they were fat, which is in a nutshell. They, they died also because they were old, etc., etc. Okay, so the way to identify the cause of a, uh, of a death is very specific to each country. And so, for example, it was clear that the, person, the, the amount of person dead from COVID is not counted the same way in Italy, France, Germany, and in the US. Uh, at least I know that. And so it's interesting because, in fact, we are uh, comparing, the, we are comparing through the news and, and the governments are comparing data that are not constructed exactly the same way and thus that don't count exactly the same thing. This is a point. So thank you. Uh, I think what what uh, what the pandemics made clear was precisely national traditions. I have to say it's interesting because the 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 said it, every. They all use it as a proxy. And for example, all the data is uh, unified in the World Health Organization. They have a, a, a uniform database about, for example, the amount of people that, the, uh, of death uh, caused by the COVID. And they simply make, make asterisks and explain that it's not exactly the same way to count, but still it's in, in the same column, you see? So it's very interesting to see this, this, uh, this articulation. And I guess, I guess we are under pressure, so we don't know exactly how to change it, uh, uh, but... Uh, for the moment, the point is precisely this, this ambiguity be between categories that have the same name, thus help uh, comparisons, but at the same time, methods that are fairly different. I don't know if I answered your question, Major Andres. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, three other questions from uh, Christopher, Andrea, Menekin, uh, and Christina. So Christopher Watts is first. If anyone else has any other questions that I um, have misinterpreted as just comments to the thread, feel free to just poke me and message me and I will um, read them as questions or announce you to speak. But Christopher Watts, go ahead. Yeah, um, okay. So um, my question is, um, so how important is it to be measured or to appear in data sets? Because I've spent most of this year working with epidemiologist models. And what struck me about their design is that it's very much shaped by the data that they thought they would be able to obtain. So, for example, if they didn't think they were going to have data on people's social networks, then social networks didn't feature in, uh, in their models of um, the transmission of epidemiology. And um, when we try and understand um, where um, transmission is occurring or why there are more deaths amongst um, Black, Asian and Middle Eastern communities in uh, London, um, it becomes um, a, a, a real problem that we don't have data on these people. So if we want um, policies to be better shaped um, for particular so, uh, communities or social groups, um, then we first need the models that influence those policies to be better shaped to those groups. So we first need to actually appear in somebody's data set so that the epidemiologists know that this data exists and that the people being measured there um, exist and how they behave and how they maybe differ in their behavior from uh, middle class educated epidemiologists. So, uh, yeah, I wonder if you had some thoughts about, um, yes, um, how important it is for a community to be measured. Uh, you, I think the game on words play, uh, works both in French and English. What is counted counts. This is a very, very obvious sentence. What is counted counts. And why is it so? Because once you're counted, then people, you can, then the category that is counted can be represented in the calculus, in the, in the quantification process. It can, it can go up to a, a, a policy decision, you see? So the point is that if you are not counted at all, uh, makes you very weak. And this was, a, this was I'm sorry to, to insist on this point. So we, we wrote a book called Stat Activism. And our point was precisely stat activism, stat, to be activist with statistics. The point is that, uh, uh, if, if you say, I am not a human, I am not a number, I am a human, I don't want to be counted, then you're simply weak. 
if you want some, if you want to be represented, if you want to be important, then you have to say the contrary. You have to count yourself and say, we are that number. That's important, you see? And so, so it's a, another way to understand your, to un answer to your question. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, counting things makes the, those things important. It's, it's, it's the first step. <laughs> um, the next question comes from Andrea Menikin. Um, Andrea, I'm going to unmute you if you want to ask it yourself. Oh, I've, yeah. Uh, yes, now. hello. Thank you, Manuel. Thanks a lot for your talk. Um, I have a question about the temporality of quantification and whether you could uh, reflect a bit on sort of different temporalities that are linked to different types of quantification. For example, in the current crisis, we have seen maybe a contraction of time horizons and some immediacy in terms of then, and that makes then experts and policymakers focused on maybe a reduction of the R figure, for example, or other you know, certain indicators at the expense of, of more long-term and more uncertain quantifications. But these are then quantifications that can be used to, I don't know, you know imagine the future in different ways, but in a way these are then sort of sidelined or, or, or shut, sort of shut out because of this, the nature of the crisis, which as you nicely described is on the one hand, a crisis of quantification, but also may give the stage to specific types of numbers, um, at least for a specific time. And that explains maybe also why only certain economic numbers might get activated. For, for example, we have then costings of what, what, if, what the furlough costs, you know, because those things are budgeted, but not much in terms of long-term effects or, or growth you know, predictions become more, yeah, more, more problematic. And that has an immediate effect on how then the future is, is envisaged. If you could have some reflections on, on different types of temporality and, and how these interact. So first of all, hello, Andrea. I'm very glad to see you. We don't see each other not enough, I think. Uh, second, uh, yes, I think you're absolutely right. There are several temporalities of, uh, of uh, numbers. And uh, one of the main thing that we heard uh, uh, here and there was that the, the, the pandemics and the waves of the pandemics are moving very quickly, whereas economics is much slower. And indeed, for example, in France, what happened is that uh, INSEE, you know what INSEE is, Institut National de la Statistique des Etudes Économiques, it's probably the equivalent in, in, uh, in Britain. I don't know what's the equivalent in Britain. Uh, so you'll, you'll say it to, to everybody. So uh, the, the point is that- <clears throat> The ONS in Britain, the Office of National Statistics. Okay, the, yeah, exactly, thank you. The Office of National Statistics. And <clears throat> uh, they decided that they, would, they, they needed to have much uh, more frequent uh, GDP measures, so that we can measure the, the effect of the lockdown on the GDP in, uh, as soon as they could. And so they, they completely, actually, they, moved, they worked like crazy, and they completely transformed the way they calculate the GDP, which is usually, it lasts two years normally, to calculate a, a, a fair uh, a measure of the GDP. And in this case, they changed it to have a, a partial GDP every, every single month. So it's very interesting. In fact, the, the, so our Office of National Statistics uh, produced new ways to, to, pro to have uh, faster economic data and more articulated to this uh, uh, public health data. Uh, this is, in a sense, what I was talking about, this, this fact that uh, they are really trying... Uh, what is important nowadays is to, to find a way to articulate uh, health data and economic data, and not only on the topics, but also on temporality. It's always the same thing. When you, when you want to change something, you have to change the temporality also of it. It's very, very important. I think you're perfectly right. Thank you, Andrew. Do you have a follow-up or was that? Okay, great. Uh, then we have one more question from Cristina Lascarides. Uh, where have you gone, Cristina? I'm trying to... Are you still on the call? You yeah. see your name. Oh, there you are. Okay. Can you hear me? Is that okay? Thank you very much. It's a little bit quiet. If you can come a little bit closer. Yes. Um, so yeah, thanks very much. Is that better? So I am, um, I have a question, which is just a bit about how you go about your work, um, which I don't know very much about, but I'm keen to, 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 to read more about uh, the work you've done. Um, so I really like your, how you started your description about what a crisis is, which is this mismatch between um, available statistics and then the phenomena that are trying to be described. And you described your first work on the Great Depression 
and the unemployment statistics. And I was wondering, how do you go about your work? How do you, um, what are the methods that you use to uncover that mismatch and to see how authorities and experts resolve those mismatches? Um, so I guess, um, I don't know, yeah, it's it's just a it's a it's a question as a as somebody who's who's interested in studying. I'm trained as an economist. Um, I'm kind of curious about how you how you do your work. Well, it was it was mainly archival arch archival work. So I, I went to the archive. But if you go back to the to the literature, for example, I, I read a lot of a, a journal that you've never opened in your life. It's the Journal of Farm Academic uh, Economics. The Journal of Farm Economics, which lasts since the end of the 19th century. And so in the 30s, for example, you have lots of paper about we our statistics don't work anymore i mean it's really obvious you just go back to the archive and and, and the, the point uh, comes up to your mind i tried to do a little bit of interviewing but all the people were so old that it was very hard actually i, I let me tell you just a, a small jo a short joke i was doing an interview and the guy was so old that he just fell uh, fell asleep on my knees <laughs> like he fainted on my knees still sleeping <laughs> so it was hard hard to do some interviews but the, the, the main point is to go back to the archive and read, read current literature in STS, Social Studies of, the, of Science. <laughs> Did I answer the question? Yes. <laughs> in, in Washington, D.C., in Washington, D.C., in the archives, it was interesting. They have in the archive of the Bureau of Farm Economics, they all, they, I even found some uh, samples of, of ground, of earth. So you see it in the card box, you had, you had some, some dust in a sense. That was, that was striking. May I ask a question? Because we have no more in the chat. Um, so, in the, in the, um, so thanks a lot for all this. Um, in, the, um, in the manifesto on the data uh, published in Nature, um, I really like the last uh, point, which is methodological but also can be think of uh, differently like it's mind the unknown and acknowledge what you don't know and uh, also acknowledge ignorance if you can because this is better modeling but this is also crucially a question when um, it's not only about science but it's about science to make decisions and so what do you um, yeah what do you think about the link between this and credibility in the, in, the, in the policy moment, because I've been wondering a lot about why to, is a politician saying something like, we don't know this, this, and this, something that is more credible than someone saying, I know everything. And in fact, um, you know, so what, how would you see the link between um, epistemic humility uh, or an alleged Acknowledgement of ignorance versus being credible as a politician. I think I think there are two two notions that we we should separate: credibility and authority. I think that uh, I think that uh, it's you you gain in credibility when you when you acknowledge your own ignorance, but you lose in authority. Because if you say I don't know, and then people would say, well, so why should I listen to you? Why should I act? As you want me to do so, so the whole problem is to is to uh, to be able to be at the same time credible and authoritarian in a sense. To, when you're the government, uh, not not uh, but when I and I have authority, <laughs> I should say, uh, when you're the, the government, and uh, and it's interesting because I think you've noticed it's changing a little bit. So nowadays the government more or less recognize more more and more the fact that they lack lack total knowledge of the situation uh, uh, this is a, a, a slight switch i think in the in the in the in the in the whole process the, the other problem that it raises is how to establish truth uh, the, the case of dr rao uh, was very interesting in, at, at the moment because the the arenas the the the, the location where validity is established are very diverse nowadays so i was very struck by dr rao's uh, uh, so you remember in, in britain i don't know if you heard about this guy in britain dr rao was the guy who uh, uh, said that hydrochloroxine was a good cure against uh, the disease you remember this and the point is that he's he's an established doctor medical doctor a very established one but his arguments were based upon only preprints 
published on his own website. Okay, so the point was that the whole scientific community, or may, the most of the scientific community, knew that his arguments were doubtful, at least doubtful, not sure, not established. But he was he had all the signs to be able to be uh, heard on other uh, lo locations. For example, he was when talk on TV and, and talking to people who are not st trained scientists. He was credible because of other reasons because he had he is a professor, etc. And so it's interesting because you have you have the the inter inter interact inter penetrations of the, all these. Uh, I would say in French, arène. De validation. I don't know if you say Aren. Uh, um, arena? No, arena. No. arena I think the direct translation arena to validation works. <laughs> so this is this is also interesting because you, you have you have you have different ways to be to, to make your, your, your talk your, your your speech credible. This is this is another point. And it's difficult to transfer those authority and credibility from one sphere to another um, in general? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah Jack, you have a question. Actually, I have one small follow-up on that. Um, your, your example um, shows the kind of negative sides of that, trans of that kind of unclear transferability of different arenas um, in that uh, maybe people who might not, who maybe should shouldn't have the credibility they do are treated as if they do. But this can also surely have other, can work in the other way too, to some degree. So if you have a internal disciplinary hierarchy, which obscures certain voices within a particular discipline, but then externally, actually they might be able to be heard. That's kind of, uh, it seems like a positive thing. So, I mean, maybe it's not the best example, but Thomas Piketty, for example, was not treated in within economics as a very serious economist for a very long time, but his book then became really popular outside of economics. And that gave him and the ideas and discussions of um, about inequality, renewed focus within economics. So it's sort, sort of, he, he played on the credibility got in a, in a public sphere um, to, to recreate the kind of discussions within the discipline. I don't know what to say. I agree completely. <laughs> yes. I, I, I think it's very interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can you can go outside of your. It's for, for the French. There is this uh, this. Uh, it's not only um, uh, disciplinary uh, different arenas, but also locations. You know, in French, you have to go in the U.S. have su some success in the U.S. to be heard in France. This is the case of Latour, for example. <laughs> he had to be, <laughs> to be received in the U.S. to be received in France afterwards. So it's exactly it's kind of the same process. So I think we should end this seminar because we are very close, um, very close to the end. Um, I would like to thank you uh, very much, Emmanuel, to join us. Uh, I would like to thank everyone on the Zoom uh, and thank you for your patience because we we not um, uh, we're not professional Zoomer. Uh, we, we're still uh, learning. Um, I just want to say we have our next seminar on the 8th of December with Andrew Minikin and it will be at 2 p.m. UK time. Uh, again, you could, um, uh, you could register on Eventbrite, uh, etc. Uh, this, um, so that's it. I don't know if you want uh, a last word, Emmanuel. Uh, I want to say thank you to everybody. It was a very great pleasure to, to be here. I hope that... Uh, uh, your your own lockdown will be cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I see that Jack has, has bones of his probably of his child's of his children behind him. No. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. My dining table. <laughs> time, to, time to spend time with the kids. <laughs> so thank you all. I'm gonna stop everything in like one minute. Um, see you soon. Take care of yourself uh, and stay safe. <laughs>